You know, when payment bank licenses were given in 2015, there was so much jubilation about the kind of inclusion that they would bring about and what kind of transformational power they would have. You know, just eight years down the line, we barely have four or five of those 11 players still in business. And I know you're constrained in the fact that you cannot give out loans, that a bulk of your deposits have to be invested in government securities. But, you know, how do you see this business model evolving? Is it sustainable? Do you think in future we will not have more payment banks? Or do you think at some point you'll have to look at lending to live and to continue to survive? Coming to this uh, previous point, out of 200 payment aggregators, 10 will survive. In payments bank case, out of 10, only 5 have survived. So <laughs> numbers actually don't really make uh, any sense of it. But more importantly is, how do you make the business model out of it? So as uh, Kamat Saab also said that when you need to do business, you need to bring the cost down to a level that it becomes near zero. I think the opportunity in front of us, whether it's a payments bank or any other bank, is how technology will enable us to bring the cost to near zero. And that is really the model in which we build up the payments bank. Rather than going in the conventional manner of sending up branches or ATMs or a huge cost on the entire field force and everything else, we, we enable a lot of merchants. We now have 14 lakh plus merchants who enable banking at the doorstep of a customer and I completely agree poor people don't need poor solutions and don't need things for free. Now I'll also give you an example is that if a person is ready to pay 30, 40 rupees for a transaction, if mind you if any if I ask anybody in the room, yeah. nobody will pay a penny for doing a transaction. But a poor people, a poor person is ready to pay 30, 40 rupees because the alternate cost to him is far higher. If he has to go to a branch, he will have to sacrifice half day of his earnings, he will have to travel, means time, cost, which will enable. So then that technology enablement through the payments bank ecosystem has actually achieved the financial inclusion mandate for which the payments bank were set. Obviously, the technology and digital has become quite, uh, quite big now. Fino started as a physical company. Now we are nearly 25% of our transactions are on UPI. It is moving into a physical to a digital model now. What we also believe is getting the model right by building up a cost light model, but a scalable model, getting your DNA in place. If you want to really service the poor person or the people on the ground, the 900, 800 million people, you can't sell a Mercedes to a guy who wants a Maruti. So product has to be developed for the purpose of the purpose of the person who you are trying to serve. So most of the banks and everybody has a DNA where they want to serve a different category of people. For servicing this kind of mass population, you need to have a common man of the country. You need to have an, have an ability to scale your business, an ability to serve him the right product, the right cost. I think that is some of the factors which helped us but grow Rishi, our business. Are you worried about scalability? Because while you're talking about this, I know you're also applying for a small finance bank license. So when I look at the payments bank model, uh, we, have, we have grown six times in the last six years, from 200 crores top line when we applied for the bank to 1,200 crores last year. One of the very few payments banks were profitable. We also went listed about a year and a half back. So we have done all the, I would say, all the right things which have to be done for any bank. And as Mr. Kamath also said, you need to be profitable. I think that is a big test for any payments company. And if you look around all the fintechs, you will find very few fintechs who are actually uh, profitable. Maybe okay. a couple of us are sitting here, <laughs> but <laughs> so, it's very difficult to find otherwise. But uh, yeah. for us, the small, fund ban is, uh, small finance bank license is a payments bank plus plus model. Mm -hmm. It enables us to do more on the liability side. It's also enabled us to offer a lending product to a customer which is already there. Let me ask you, Srinivasu, what are fintech players getting wrong? I mean. Uh, you know, you became profitable within six years of operations and I recall you saying that you had raised only three and a half million dollars. That's all. And you know, this frenzy of funding that we've seen in the fintech companies, the high cash burn, and, and still, you know, profitability is far away. What are they doing wrong? I know we're talking about a period that was a little while back and circumstances have changed, but what would be your lessons that you could share with them? I think let's look at what the fintechs did right. They saw a market in which there was uh, capital available. Uh, 
to experiment and to build. Uh, so they figured that how to leverage that, right? The market didn't put a premium or a priority to figuring out the right business model or profitability. So they did things right. They understood the market. They were catering to which at that point was the investor, and they uh, did things right. Now, and basis that they've looked at speed to market as being the the key thing to work on. And so you build a cost model to achieve that objective. As the framework changes, I think what did they get wrong? Uh, I think what, what the market as a whole uh, has gotten wrong is to believe that this would stay unregulated. Right? The moment you put a regulatory framework or you anticipate a regulatory framework, there is a way you look at business and cost that's inevitable to come. So I think that's the, that's the transition phase. Uh, it's come at a point when people will kind of clean up their acts to figure out how to become profitable. Okay, uh, so Charita, let me pick up from there on the regulatory aspect of it. You know, uh, first they were unregulated, you know, it was often said that there was light touch regulation. Now with the digital lending guidelines and, you know, a series of circulars from RBI, whether it is almost killing the BNPL model and whatnot, how has life changed for you in the last couple of years? Do you think, you know, fintechs need to necessarily look at being regulated, getting an NBFC license to survive in this ecosystem? I don't think so. I, I think that both models will coexist uh, and the digital lending guidelines with the first loss um, uh, of 5% now becoming a reality, um, uh, you know, actually now makes it possible, uh, right, uh, for um, digital players to exist. Now, the 5% has many implications. It means that you need to get your underwriting right uh, because you can't put unlimited first loss. Uh, you, you know, and you can't buy your way uh, through a partnership. And therefore, the underwriting model really needs to be uh, correct. To go back to your previous point and to Srinivas's previous point, customer unit economics have to be positive. Uh, right, uh, uh, that was sort of one of the golden rules, 101 rules of any business, whether it's a fintech business, uh, whether it's an FMCG business, whether it's a bank, the customer at a unit level over a period of time must be profitable. Shinjiri, would you say Sucharita is one of the exceptions? Because, you know, a lot of these new rules that have come in have really disrupted the business model of certain players. Some of them even went out of business. Is the industry and the regulator not on the same page? So I'll, I'll come to that later because the thought that's been playing in my mind is this, um, it is, I, I don't actually agree that when you, that, uh, you know, the expectation that you will start to make money uh, and only then you will be valuable is correct. Because if that's how the world was built, then the world would have never changed. The world has only ever changed when capital has moved to frontiers, whether it is the gold diggers of, uh, you know, America, or whether it is the Silicon Valley people, or whether it is, uh, you know, Indian fintech, which has been... So, you know, uh, people's habits are hard to change. And ask me, because I am trying to build a, a fintech for women, non-men, because, you know, men tend to be primary customers of financial services. I'm seeing this room and I'm thinking, oh, yes, good. And uh, so what happens is that you realize that for, and all of you have, know many women in your lives, right? Now think about how hard it is for this woman to, even if she understands that there are platforms available, to change from that habit of simply asking you on a Saturday morning to do something because, you know, you'll not do the dishes, you'll not take the child for the thing. So you will probably be the person who, can, who will be happy to talk to the investment advisor. So that's what you will do while she'll be planning the party. She'll be as educated, she went to the same college and everything. But that's how the division of labor works. Now think about that person's habit changing from doing that to now doing this, which is I will do this myself. That habit change will never happen on a unit economics logic. That will only happen on the logic of, you know, driving that change. Now, 
Uh, it's this, I don't know how many people here started to cook during COVID. A lot of men started to cook during COVID. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, we cooked before COVID also. So a lot of men started cooking during COVID. And all of a sudden, you had, you know, food where ingredients being delivered in sexy packages to homes. And suddenly everybody was a chef. Everybody was showing off nice food. Uh, men started washing clothes and some laundry company came up with a detergent ad for men. So you know what I'm saying? The equivalent of that, the equal and opposite of that to do, to change behavior of a customer who's not used to doing things in a certain way, requires capital. Now, if you're a profit maker, if you're Hindustan Unilever, you will take that capital out of one pocket and you will say, I'm investing it into this new set of customer. Let men start buying detergent. They'll buy expensive detergent. It pleases their ego. Put some color on it and sell it to them. You can do it from your existing profit pools. But if you're a disruptor, if you don't have that capital that's coming out of your pockets, then you need that source of capital because otherwise that person has, anybody who's vested in the ecosystem is not going to drive that change. All right. Uh, thank you very much for sharing those thoughts. Uh, Chetna, Sucharita, Shinjini, Srinivasu, Rishi, all of you, thank you very much for your time here. We're going to conclude it on that note. And thank you all for being a wonderful audience.